Thanks for tuning in to the Women's Vibrancy Code, a podcast dedicated to helping women move from exhausted to energized, balance their hormones, and feeling turned on by their life, their lover, and themselves. I'm your host, Mariah Brown. I'm a Yale and functional medicine trained women's health expert, midwife, mom, keynote speaker, and self-made entrepreneur. I'm the founder of my signature program, the Women's Vibrancy Code. So sit back relax, and let's chat about your energy, hormones, libido, and embracing your feminine power. Oh, and you might want to have pen and paper to take some notes on some of these episodes. Welcome to the Women's Vibrancy Code. Mariah Brown here, and we're going to today talk about boundaries the boundaries that we want to set, the boundaries that we do set, how we maintain them, what boundaries are, how we prioritize ourselves and how we butt up against all the who am I stories and am I worthy of setting a boundary, all the stuff that I know already you're like, oh, boundaries, I don't know. (laughs) Krista, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Oh, it just, you're right, Mariah. It brings up so much stuff for people, which is why it's like, well, you know, that boundary is really not that important. And I'll just go along to get along and we acquiesce and we subordinate and we continue to just walk on eggshells. Mm -hmm. So it really like this conversation, I think is so um, foundational. Yes. It's it's basic and yet it's so deep and nuanced and complex and essential if you really want to believe and trust and know that more is coming. (laughs) Yeah. Like, (laughs) so for those of you listening to the podcast, you can't see, but I'm wearing a sweatshirt right now that says more is coming. And it's by the quantum woman by Shamina Taylor. And, um, it's so true. And, you know, this is such perfect timing because this morning I went on a walk with my husband and we have three young children. They're 10, eight, and five right now, as I'm recording this and just talking about how much we long for more quiet time journaling and more quiet time reading. And we were just in the midst of our conversation trying to figure out, okay, how do we set boundaries for us personally to prioritize it? And then I went, well, wait a minute. What if we set family boundaries where it doesn't have to exclude the children? It's not about finding those moments when they're gone, but can we find times in the week where we all do it together, even the five-year-old? Mm -hmm. And so we've just decided this morning before this interview that we're going to try twice a week. We always do dinner at 530, usually start bedtime around 730. So from 630 to 730 p.m. at night, we're going to have an hour of quiet time where we can each be in the living room space together. Mm -hmm. Everyone can have a book, a puzzle, a journal, whatever it may be. And we're going to try it on. And I know it's going to bring up (laughs) boundary setting stuff because inevitably you know, there's always other things to be done and kids throwing tantrums and homework that we forgot to do. And anyway, let me read your bio before we get too far into this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Krista Resnick is a master coach, boundary expert podcaster and mother to three adultish boys. When you say adultish, what is that? (laughs) Well, they are adults. I mean, they're 18, 20 and 23. Yeah. Act like adults, maybe not as much. (laughs) Okay. All right. All right. (laughs) Um, Her love and passion for boundaries is the byproduct of her own story. Having spent decades pleasing everyone else, Krista felt disempowered, inauthentic, and passionless in every aspect of her life. Through her own personal healing work, she began to find great empowerment through the art of boundaries and expressing her truth. Now, serving hundreds of women across the globe, Krista has witnessed the transformative power of embodying healthy boundaries, both from the cognitive level and the physical or soma level. I think of somatic soma. She strongly believes that a well-boundaried life empowers women to stop people pleasing and come back home to themselves so they can create lives and relationships that are purposeful and passion fueled. Yes. Yum, yum. Okay. So I've got to start. You said with your life story. So 
Can you tell us a little bit of your own story and what that looked like? And we had, there was, was there a moment, like the aha moment, the transformative moment where you went, it's time. Yeah, I think there were, well, there were a couple moments, both fun, fun stories, both totally different stories that maybe the, the listeners will really resonate with. I really believe that we learn through somebody else's story. Storytelling is so powerful. So I'd love to share those, but it was really a, a childhood history of being raised in what I love to call the church of one right way. Mm. So very strict, very rule-based, not relationship-based. There wasn't space for me to have my big feelings. There wasn't room for me to have my big emotions. There wasn't really a space for me to be me. And so I learned from a very, very, very early age that the experts, the big people, they always knew more than I did. And my role was just to sit down and be quiet and play the good girl and to put that nice girl mask on. Because what I started to notice very early on was when I wore the nice girl mask, I got a little bit of attention. Mm -hmm. I got a little bit of validation. I got a little bit of at a girl. And so this carried on as you can imagine, into adolescence, 20s, 30s, like mid to late 30s, until it really began to destroy my life. There wasn't a big, huge moment, Mariah, but there were these little things such as one morning, I got all of the kiddos on the bus to head to school. Neighbor down the street comes over. We're going to do coffee. Great. We're going to connect. We're going to have some time of beautiful conversation. So she comes over around eight o'clock. She's still there (laughs) with the kiddos. Get off the bus at close to four o'clock. Not because I wanted her to be there because I didn't know I had another option. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know that I could ask her to leave. I was so wrapped up in the what will she think of me? What will she say? Will she tell the other neighbors that I'm just a cold-hearted snob? It's really not the nice thing to do. I mean, I've got this laundry list of things I want to accomplish, but really, I mean, you can't actually ask someone to leave. Mm -hmm. I can totally recall all of the somatic symptoms in my body, the lump in my throat, the heat in my cheeks, wanting desperately to just say, will you please get a clue and leave? (laughs) Not that that's the right way to say things, but I was so dysregulated. I was so frustrated at that moment because I didn't think I would. I didn't think that was an option for me. So that was one little example. Another example was when we had gone on vacation, I came home and had the vacation blues like you couldn't even believe. I mean, just sad and down in the dumps. And that was my first moment of awareness to kind of lean in and get curious, say, what is going on here? Have I like, have I really set my life up that the only good thing I have to look forward to are these moments of getting away, these moments where we we get to escape and that can be fun sometimes, right? There's, I mean, obviously we all love to travel and have experiences and, and go on vacation, but this was different. And I knew that this was different and it started me down this path of, you don't really know who you are. Mm -hmm. You don't really know what you stand for. You're living your life trying to, to grab hold of the next handbag, trying to grab hold of the next shopping spree, because that was kind of my vice a little bit, trying to grab hold of the next vacation or the next this or the next that. So my Mm -hmm. life became this accumulation of reaching outside of myself to try to to try to understand who I was Mm -hmm. because I didn't know who I was based on that self-abandonment when I was a little girl. Mm. There's three things that you said that really popped out at me. Number one, I think about Brene Brown. Um, What I remember hearing is the three second no. Like the example that I remember is uh, the the mommies or the PTA are asking her, can you make brownies? 
And she just took a deep breath and said, thank you for asking, but no, I'm not going to be available to make brownies this week. Turn around, take another deep breath, count to three and walk away. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The second thing I heard you say was the, the journey of setting boundaries really starts with getting clear with who am I? What do yeah. I stand for? Yep. And really embodying my power and my self love is my guess, so that there's a space for the boundaries to begin. And the third one that I heard you say that I actually want to turn into a question was that the nice girl got validation. Yeah. And that, my guess, is a big bomb that you just dropped because I don't know about you, but it's definitely something that I'm in the process of actively looking back at the choices that I've made, the ways in which I've presented myself, been navigated relationships. And I go, huh, Mm. all the threads of I'm looking for validation externally. And, And I don't know if I played nice girl necessarily, but my guess is everyone who's listening has picked up some pattern of being that they learned early on, gave uh, them the attention and the validation of those that were supposed to love them. So I'm curious if you, would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. About. About the choices that we have made. Yeah. That, that continue Mm-hmm. And it's really a search for validation because we yeah. were taught early on that I do this or don't do this. I be this way or don't be this way. And I receive validation. And I imagine that is a big piece. Huge. To boundary setting. Huge, huge. Because what happens, Mariah, is that we've got this whole world coming at us. And of course, with the introduction of social media and the internet, even more so the world is at our fingertips, literally telling us who we are, who we need to be showing us pictures of, well, the next fad is to, and this is, this is no judgment. This is just something that I don't know, for whatever reason, I have the strangest images come through (laughs) intuitively, but, you know, telling us that now the next fad is to have these like butt injections, like you like the hormone pellets or actual like changing the shape of their butts. Yes. Changing the shape of the butts, <laughs> butt shape changers. Okay. Right. But sha- right. The Kardashians <laughs> came on board and it was like, all of a sudden it's cool to have things put in your butt to make this big butt. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. Like, yeah. so if you don't have a good sense of who you are and what you stand mm-hmm. for, you're just going to be privy to anybody telling you what the cool thing is, what the latest fad is, right. you should do this. You're not enough as you are. You need these butt plugs or whatever they are, right? Not butt plugs. Just, those are a little bit okay, different. No. <laughs> That's another podcast. I don't even know. What they're, and this is my is, realm, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, not my realm. Um, stick to what you know, Resnick. Come on now. <laughs> Get it together. <laughs> But you you get my gist, right? Like yeah. you are just open and available to yeah. anything and any right. anyone who tells you how you should be showing up in life because you haven't built your own house on a solid foundation. Right. And so in that scenario, the validation comes from this famous person or this pit person that I'm supposed to know, love and trust is yeah. doing this thing. Yeah. So if I'm not coming from a truly grounded space, if I do that thing, well, now I'm getting validated that it must be right. Or yeah. buying the new handbag. If it's if it's coming from the space of looking for validation outside versus yeah. true intrinsic desire. Yeah. Or I heard in your example, be nice girl. And that got you mm-hmm. validation and attention. And so then it showed up and not boundary setting in your relationships. Because you're trying to be nice girl and that's how you get attention. And that's how you receive love from those that are there around you that are supposed to. It's so fascinating. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Really the, the unmet needs. It's my favorite quote. The unmet needs of our inner child is what will wreak havoc on our adult life. Yeah. We will search and search and search to fill those unmet needs of being Mm -hmm. seen 
of being listened to, of being heard, of belonging, of connection. We will continue. Safety is a big one as well. We will continue to seek those things out in our adulthood. And typically they just create chaos in our adult life until we go back and really heal them and stop putting the bandaid on the, on the bullet hole. Right. And so rather than looking for all of the validation externally, my guess is we start, what I'm hearing is we start with the validation internally to really know who we are as individuals and the, and then our boundary setting. And we're going to talk about boundaries. <laughs> we haven't even gotten there yet. Yeah. The well, we kind of have, because <laughs> you can't yeah. set a boundary if you don't know who you are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because boundaries but, are about. And I imagine, honest. I imagine you also can't set a boundary if it's coming from the need for validation externally. The boundary has to come mm-hmm. from this is for my own personal validation. If there's validation at all, it's coming from that place of I'm grounded. I know who I am. I know what I need, and it comes from within. And so my yeah. boundaries come from within with what I actually need. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So what are boundaries? Oh, well, I want to really encourage people that that's actually my favorite question. And I know it seems so basic and it's not totally favorite question. I think that boundaries actually can be whatever really works for you. I mean, if it's, if your definition and how you're living in accordance with boundaries, if that's working for you, keep doing it. I don't believe because this was so much of my childhood, right? That there's one right way. And I definitely won't lean into any therapy type treatments, any, any, I won't endorse any coaching type programs that say this is the right way. It's like, Sometimes we just try these different things, these modalities, and this leads us to this, and this leads us to this, and it just works, right? Mm-hmm. However, so I, the first thing is I really want to encourage people to get clarity around what, what does a boundary look like, feel like, sound like for you? For me, and this is what I teach you know, my clients and students, is that it's a couple different things. First of all, it's about being honest with who you are. And so oftentimes we have to go back and even do that work around who are you? So boundaries are really self-discovery work. They're self-worth work, direct reflective. Because if you have a full self-love tank, you really know who you are. You're probably not going to struggle with boundaries a whole heck of a lot. Maybe here and there a little bit when it's a relationship that you really, really care about but you're probably going to be pretty solid in your foundation. Typically people come to me because they don't have that foundation of really knowing who they are and loving who they are. The other definition that I absolutely love to play with, and this is getting us a little bit on the somatic level, is boundaries are really the point at which you can really no longer be yourself. So what do I mean by that? When something externally is coming at you, and I can give a beautiful example of something that just happened to me not too terribly long ago so that it can really land home for listeners. When something externally is coming at you in that moment, you've got some choices. It's like a fork in the road. You can either regulate yourself, connect with yourself and stay true to who you actually are and what you stand for. Again, that's being honest, right? That's being authentic. That's being genuine. Or you can go into fight, flight, or freeze. And so often that's where we will find ourselves in those fight, flight, and freeze um, moments where we'll, we'll acquiesce or we'll giggle at a joke that we actually didn't think was funny. Or we'll start to walk on eggshells or we'll placate rather than say, you know what, in this moment, I am so uncomfortable and I'm speaking my truth anyway, because that's what's honest and that's who I really am. So back several months ago, my husband and I were at a social gathering and there was a gentleman that walked up to me that I know and wanted to share with me a joke. So he pulls up his phone and and it was a meme of some, some sort, and I didn't find it funny. I found it rooted in some oppressive type garbage, really, if I'm being honest. 
And in that moment, I could feel all of the somatic symptoms. Like there was no boundary script in that moment that was going to help me because I, I couldn't prepare for that. I didn't know that moment was coming. Right. And there's where boundary scripts can and can't be helpful. It's really fun to play with boundary scripts because so many of us never got the language when we were kids. Right. We had poor modeling of what boundaries were parents, caregivers that didn't model, you know, good boundaries. So we never learned that language. And what are you going to do? Walk around with your boundary script, your list of rules for everybody, like at every social engagement you go to, not going to happen. Right. What are examples on the boundary script? So like when this person does this, this is what I say. Such as? Mm, When you tell me an oppressive joke, I'm going to walk away. Or I mean, and you could do that, but I had no idea this guy was going to walk up to me and tell me an oppressive joke. Mm -hmm. All I knew in that moment, Mariah, was my system felt flooded. I felt Mm -hmm. so how it shows up for me is the lump in the throat because I suppressed my truth for so many decades. So that's always where, you know, I know, oh man, you know, stuff's going down here. (laughs) Stuff is happening in my system, Mm -hmm. lump in the throat. And it's like somebody took a a temperature gauge. That's what you call it. Like a dial on an oven and turns my temperature up to about five bajillion degrees. So my face gets, you know, kind of flush. My ears get really hot. And it's that moment where I know, ding, 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 alarm bells are going off. What are you going to do here, Krista? Mm -hmm. Are you going to laugh and go along to get along because you're afraid of what he's going to go tell so-and-so? Well, she's a real bag. Who brought buzzkill, right? Mm -hmm. Tried to tell her this joke and she was like climbing up my butt. Or am I going to say in that moment, this is what's true for me. Right. And I don't appreciate that joke. Got it. So what I'm hearing is, because when I think about fight, flight, or freeze, I think Palm sweating, heart racing, respiratory rate goes up, blood flow to the extremities, brain yep. doesn't work as clearly, flushing. And so what I'm hearing is when you're having that somatic experience of fear, of nervousness, that, that for you, it's a sign that you're out of alignment yep. and need to check yourself. Yep. And if there's a boundary that needs to be set or a boundary that was crossed that hadn't been set and it's time or a reset. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's where the more we do this work. So this is why the definition of a boundary is so important because sometimes when we're new to boundary work, we have to have rigid boundaries. That's just what works for a while in order to do some repair and to plug some of those energy leaks. I had very rigid boundaries when I first started doing this work because I was so boundaryless. but guess what? One morning I woke up and I said, well, gosh almighty, I'm kind of, I'm kind of lonely and I'm kind of disconnected and I'm kind of isolated because I had made everything. No, 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 no. I had my list of rules and boundaries really are not lists of rules. We don't function well in relationships with here's my list of rules. You follow them and we'll be all good. (laughs) So as we start to do this work more and more and really build a nourished and flexible nervous system, we get to be more fluid with our boundaries. So again, in that moment, when that gentleman walked up to me, I had no idea that that was going to happen. Right. So I didn't have any boundary scripts with me. I, I just knew in my body, whoa, what's going on? And that was my cue to check in with myself and take that moment and connect with myself before I did anything. And it's also what the boundaries aren't. So it's not about rigid rules. You know, I'm thinking in the context of nutrition, right? Because I'm helping women really maximize their wellness, their energy, their hormones through nutrition. And often women come into the space and they've had all of these rigid rules that they've tried to keep to like the elimination diets and keto yeah. and intermittent fasting. And it just feels like the walls are caving in on them and they're so tightly holding on to all the rules. And I go, well, everything in moderation, even moderation, this is around pleasure. Like how do we find a lifestyle that feels empowering and, and spectacular that are setting boundaries with what you choose to put into your body, not because you're a victim, but because you like to feel good. Yeah. And it's a, it's a boundary from an intrinsic space, 
but it's not the rules that feel like they're self-limiting. I think that what yeah. I'm hearing from you is that's a, that's a very subtle, but important distinction as we're setting boundaries. Very. And I would actually venture to say, I could be wrong. I don't know. I'd love to hear your take even on this, that some of that rigidity with the eating and really any area of life we're talking about is because there's not the self-trust yet. Yeah. So those boundaries, typically the reason why the rigid boundaries won't work forever, they, they can definitely be reparative for a while. Mm-hmm. But what happens is often we are setting them out of control and fear Mm -hmm. and we just can't sustain that. Right. And maybe it's also as we develop new patterns, there's value in having a little bit more rigidity. Like I I have the visual of two ladders, like the ladder with the, the rungs that are closer together. It's just a little bit easier to climb up. And so maybe early on, the boundaries do feel a little bit more rigid when we're as parents, when we're setting clear boundaries with our kids up front, we're going to make them strong. Like I've been told, I don't know if this, you know, I don't, I don't do world in the, I don't like to touch the parenting world because it's so personal, but for me, keep those boundaries rigid and tight up front and then they can be loosened over time. But as a parent, if we start out willy nilly and then try to tighten it up, good luck. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I imagine same thing. If boundary setting is new for someone who's listening, what I'm hearing from you is maybe at the beginning, we do set a little bit more strict and we practice on a more regular basis. And it might feel somewhat rigid until the, it becomes more habitual. And then as we grow in our self-trust and it becomes a lifestyle, then those rungs of the ladder get to go further apart because we're not having to take as many steps. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. Because what you're really doing is you're proving to yourself and you're proving to your nervous system that I can, I can stand true to myself. I can stay true to me in these moments of dysregulation. Right. And so it's the confidence, the inner confidence that leads to more worthiness, that leads to more confidence (laughs) in setting the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so- why do you think boundaries can be so difficult for many? Mm, so typically one of the areas I love to talk about is, well, there, there's, there's actually several reasons. Number one, I think is that boundaries don't fit into our list of, um, it's like when we look back into caveman days, right? We were we were connected or we were created for connection, for belonging. And if you stepped outside of the cave to go blueberry picking and the saber toothed tiger was behind the blueberry bush, you were as good as gone, right? So boundaries, it's like, it's, it's this dangerous thing. It's, it's, they feel so unsafe because it's almost as if they're sort of going against our hardwiring because we are created to connect and to belong with our posse, with our hive, with our community. So it's almost like they don't fit into our little rule book. So that can be number one. Number two, I know to be true from my own journey and from the clients that I work with is that 99.9% of people hate, loathe, detest conflict. (laughs) They hate it. And they hate it because they've been taught that conflict equals bad. And I want to help people understand that conflict is just feedback. Like it's just feedback for your system. Doesn't mean it's bad. We have to learn how to ride the waves of it. We have to learn how to come back home to ourselves through it. And conflict can be such a beautiful thing to collect the data and to go, okay, this is great feedback. What are we going to do with this? Mm -hmm. Another reason that boundaries are so challenging is that most of us live at the cognitive level. We are walking around this world as if we are these human heads we forgot that there's a beautiful body from the neck down. And so we're not getting the messaging of the body. 
We are praised for how much we know. We are praised for the last book we wrote, for the last PhD that we got, for the promotion that we received, or you name it, like just the the wisdom and the knowledge that we have. But the body, like, eh, what's that? Feelings, emotions, sensations, what are you talking about? We're just not trained in that area. So we're living in our heads and we forget that this beautiful body holds so much information and so much feedback. So in that moment, because I was tapped in and because I've done this work for so long now, when that gentleman came up to me at the social gathering, I was able to go, whoa, lump in the throat, temperatures rising. Oh, what's happening here? What is happening? But I couldn't have done that years ago. I I would have just gone right, boom, somatic symptoms. Oh, that's a funny joke. Thanks for telling me that joke. (laughs) Right? Like there would have been no moment of pause to do the check-in. And for some people that might not feel like a boundary they need to set, like not important to me. I'm going to laugh, not laugh. In your scenario, it gave you a somatic experience where you're saying, this is part of my core value and it's a boundary that I need to set. Yeah. And for me, um, going along to get along in that moment and and you're spot on for other people that might, might not have been, they might've been totally okay with just going out, whatever, and walking away Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for me. I know that I would have woke up the next morning and I would have felt out of integrity with myself. Uh So that's really where you want to start checking in Mm -hmm. is does this choice I'm about to make reflect who I'm striving to be or who I am? Mm -hmm. And at some point, Mariah, we've got to get serious about that. We have to. Like right now. How about starting today? Right. Starting this very moment. You're listening to this starting yeah. today. Yeah. So, okay. Regarding um, boundaries being difficult, it goes back to this conversation at the beginning around validation, right? So if we have received validation historically from belonging, from doing what's right, from being the nice girl, from being quiet, whatever it may be, and then boundary setting goes against the grain, it seems like what I'm hearing is it becomes viscerally in our bodies difficult initially because we're going against all the childhood conditioning of how we receive validation. Mm -hmm. And then we go, okay, wait a minute. If I'm going to set a boundary and create a little bit of conflict, it was what I heard you say, is that going to change the validation that comes from externally? And so once again, we're getting to know ourselves and allowing the validation to come from within when we're clear on what are my values? What Mm -hmm. boundaries are important to me and what boundaries aren't? And then regarding fear of conflict, I think it's like how fascinating that people won't rock the boat. They won't stand up for what's important to them. They won't speak their truth out of fear of conflict. I always go, my friends, there's a law of rhythm. The tides come in, the tides go out. Yeah. End of story. Like, (laughs) I I can't imagine a life or I don't want to live a life where there's never conflict. There's never emotion. There's never contrast. Yeah. Like that's part of the richness of life. We get to rock the boat. Sometimes we get yeah. to feel anger and frustration and sadness and joy and ecstasy and orgasm and love and all of it. Yeah. And know that when the tide goes back out, it's coming back in mm-hmm. and that contrast creates the richness in our experience of it. Yeah. And yet it is a reason why boundary setting feels difficult for people. Bingo. What do we do with it? How do we fix it? (laughs) Mm, Yeah. So several things. I think for me, I did so many things, Mariah. Um, You know, I worked so much for years on the mental level and that was cool. It got me to a certain point and it didn't. (laughs) didn't carry me. I don't want to say across the finish line because when it comes to healing and growth, there is no such thing as a finish line, Mm -hmm. but only working from the mental level, working from mindset, it was like putting a bandaid on a bullet hole. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really dealing with the patterns. I wasn't really dealing with what does 
my inner child need? What are some of the wounds? What are some of the traumas that she's still carrying? How can I tend to those? How can I really see her? How can I really help her feel safe? How can I bring in safety in a new way, not in this unhealthy way that I've been doing by spending money frivolously? That's a big word. (laughs) (laughs) Or, um, you know, heavy drinking or running from this activity to the next, busy, 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 so that we don't ever have to feel. Mm -hmm. So, For me, it was doing the deeper inner work along with building and nourishing a flexible nervous system, really building out. Some folks refer to it as window tolerance. I like to call it my window of capacity or even better yet, my window of dignity. Because in those moments where I'm setting a boundary from fear, and sometimes I still do that, Um, when I'm setting a bound, well, when I'm not setting a boundary and I'm just porous and kind of loosey goosey with my boundaries, I'm out of integrity again with myself and I'm outside my window of dignity. When I'm in my window of dignity, that is not how I want to show up. I want to show up. I don't know if this is a word, but I often say I make up my own words. I want to show up dignified like really standing in my dignity, knowing that the choices that I'm making and the boundaries I'm setting and the behaviors that I'm, that I'm implementing, that my children are watching and my partner's watching and anybody else that's watching, that they are supporting my future self and supporting me in the way that I want to go. And so for me, that was really working on the somatic level, truly yeah. working with the nervous system, working with the inner child, working with all of the parts of me that show up daily. That's what really helped me heal. Yes. Not that we ever heal ED and there's no, you know, we're never done. And I say that with encouragement, like not to have people go, really, when is this going to be over? It's until we're six feet under, there's always another layer. There's always another, another level, which I think is exciting. It reminds me, there's a quote that I heard that I share often and I love. Question was posed who is the most important individual in your life that feels proud of you? And it's not your mother. It's not your children. The answer was it's the eight-year-old version of you and the 80-year-old version of you. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing from you is for, for us each to really dig into who am I? What do I stand for? What does my dignity mean? What does respect mean to me? Yeah. How do I want to exist in social settings? Mm. What does love feel like? What does respect feel like? What does it not feel like? Yeah. And can I quiet down and say, in the way that I'm living my day, the choices that I'm making, would the eight-year-old version of me and the 80-year-old version of me say, hell yeah, good Mm -hmm. job. I'm guessing that boundaries aren't just simply saying no. Right. Right. But can you talk a little bit about like what what are boundaries outside of, of just simply saying no, stop, not? For those of you listening to the podcast, I'm putting my hand up. Like I think about my my five year old. Her first word, this is so cute. Her first word, she'd put her hand straight out and she would say space. <laughs> because my middle daughter has a lot of exuberance and she's like definitely like in in your energy. And so my youngest, I mean, she just learned she is a boundary setter. Physically. Yeah, I love Space. it. I so love it. Other than this energy of like hand out away, no. What else is boundary setting? <sighs> boundary setting for me is about being honest with who you are with what you need and what you have the capacity for Mm. at this season in your life. Yes. I love this idea of what you have the capacity for in this season. Like that could be at two o'clock in the afternoon versus 8 Mm a.m. That could be during your bleeding time versus your ovulatory time. That could be during summer versus winter. Yeah. That could be when you're working or when you're home. I mean, it's the, to allow the boundary setting to be able to be, this is who I am, but also 
particularly for women, we're such dynamic, ever-changing beings. This is what's important to me in a boundary that I need to set during this time. And this is what I have capacity for. Yeah. During this XYZ chapter. That's so good. Isn't it? Isn't it? Mm-hmm. And I track my cycle. So I know that when, you know, I'm sort of ending down, I'm kind of in my luteal phase. I don't have the capacity mm-hmm. that I do in follicular and the other phases. So my boundaries get a little tighter. Yep. My yep. self nurturance gets upped. Lots of beautiful, you know, salt baths. Um, you know, typically the legs go up the wall at nine o'clock at night. I've got the eye pillow. I mean, my husband's like, what is happening in here? <laughs> got yes. the incense burning. Legs are up against the wall to kind of regulate yes. my nervous system. Got the mm-hmm. nice warm blanket. I've got the heated eye uh, pillow on my eyes so that I can really just nurture and drop into myself and get a beautiful night's rest so that I can still show up and do some of the things that I have committed to and really stand in my window of dignity. Yes. So good. It's so good. It's so important that we're talking about this. It's fascinating because for those of you listening to the podcast, we're recording this in October and I'm actually doing a a women's circle, a virtual women's circle in a couple of weeks. And it's specifically on this topic because we're going into fall winter time in the season. Yeah. And it really is a time that our capacity is different. Mm-hmm. We, we want to quiet down. We want to go a little bit more inside. We want to get into the creative kind of introspective space. We want to be a little bit more cautious of who we're surrounding ourselves with. It's Thanksgiving, it's Christmas, wow. right? And then you mentioned the luteal phase. That's also like that PMS week, right? For those mm-hmm. of you that don't know. And I think of that as fall. Yeah. Yeah. So in any 28 day cycle, that's also the time where that is not the time where we have the capacity to do the TEDx talk and throw the big parties and do all the overachieving stuff during summertime, during springtime, during your ovul- your ovulatory time. Yes, yes. Yeah. Your capacity is different. And so boundary setting is who, who am I? What do I stand for? But also who am I? during this chapter of my life, when I'm postpartum, when I'm perimenopausal. Yeah. This yeah. when I'm traveling. Yeah. Yeah. My husband and I are entering a, so it's literally fall here as we're recording and I am in a fall season. Mm-hmm. You know, we are on the edge of being empty nesters and talking about what is life going to look like? Like, what what are some of the things that we may want to be thinking about letting go of? Because we are stepping into freedom, more adventure, more play. We still don't know what that's going to look like, but we're having those conversations. And so, of course, that includes boundaries. What are my work hours going to be? How much am I going to be available to clients? Will I offer a group coaching program? If I do, will that be live? Because that commits me more, right? Mm -hmm. Should I be thinking about evergreen in the future so that we can just be traveling and doing some of the things that we want to do? Because in this season of our life, this is who we are, and this is what we stand for, and this is what we need. Mm-hmm. So important. And our boundary setting around going to the gym yeah. and how we want to work out. Like we get to set boundaries during winter time when the snow is outside. Maybe it's not the best time to go for a run. Yeah. And when you're in your bleeding time or in your scenario about to be an empty nesting family. Mm hmm. During fall to say, okay, I have the capacity to be social and ask the questions externally, but only with the individuals that are really in my close network. Yeah. And then when I'm in winter, I'm going to go hibernate Mm -hmm. and I'm going to get really quiet and actually go inside. Yeah. All right. um, We're about done. Would you just... Go ahead and just promote yourself. Like, what do you do What yeah. for people that are leaning in and they're going, okay, wait, how do I work with her? Yeah. What kind of work does she do? Can you just, and obviously your website and your social yeah. media handles are in the description of the Facebook live and are also in the show notes for the podcast, but just tell the audience a little bit about the work that you do, what it is, what it isn't, the boundaries yeah. that you set with how you support, what, I'm going to say women, because everyone in my world is women, but I imagine men too, in boundary setting. I help, I I 
pretty exclusively work with women. I have worked with men. They do actually have many of the same issues. And it's not that I won't work with men. It's just I primarily that women are just who come to me. But I help them set boundaries from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Because again, when you're standing there with your little script, because that's all you know how to do, because all you've done is just work from that mental mindset level, which please hear me say that is important, right? Mindset is incredibly important. And it cannot be the only thing that we hang our hats on. So when you're standing there with your script and your knees are knocking and your temperature is rising and you have the lump in your throat and the tears are formulating behind your eyes and you can't get it out of your mouth, we really want to work on a deeper level of what's going on there. Let's look at the nervous system and let's build a flourishing nervous system so that you can stand there even when your knees are knocking, even when you feel sweaty under the armpits and speak your truth because you know who you are and what you stand for. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little while ago about fight, flight, freeze. And I, you know, I work a lot on the fawning level. So that level of fawning, meaning basically who do I need to be? What do I need to do? to make this situation simmer down? Do I need to be the placator here? Do I need to be the perfectionist? Do I need to be the totally girl? Like, oh, totally. I got you. Totally. I will bring you 55 pans of brownies when you come home from the hospital. I totally got you PTA. Like, to- like I always laugh because it's when I was in middle school. I don't know. I don't know how old you are, Mariah, but Sweet Valley High books were the thing. Totally. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were I based, you know, those Sweet Valley High girls out of, I don't know if it was Northern or Southern California, but that's how they talked. Totally. Totally. I'll totally do that. So I love to kind of, you know, add a little levity in and say the totally girl. I totally got the brown, brownie girl scout, whatever, whatever that posse is called. Yeah. Brown, brownies and girl scouts. I think it is. Right. I don't know. Uh, Whatever it is. Yeah. I totally got, you know, volunteering at soccer practice 35 nights a week. Um, So we can really start to work on a deeper nervous system level to start to bring in other healthy ways of showing up so that we're not relying on that fawning pattern. Mm -hmm. And so right now, as we're doing this interview, it sounds like you're it possibly in a recreation and reiteration of, of how you do that. But right now is most of your work one-on-one or in group settings? Is it in person? Is it online? Both. So right now I work one-on-one with people Mm -hmm. and I also have a group coaching program that I just launched. We are just inching in on module number two. So month number two, and that is called from fawn to fierce. So it's all about busting up that fawning pattern, not even busting it up. I mean, it is and it isn't right because that fawning pattern has kept us safe. So many of us, right? Like they're not wrong, but we want to look at them and honor them and acknowledge them and see how they have a yes, kept us safe and how they've kept us limited. Mm -hmm. So we want to try to bring in some new resources. We want to try to resource our nervous system and our body with some other things. Yeah. And we want to really move into this, what I like to call fierce mama bear energy, you know, that energy that you so lovingly and, and beautifully pour out onto everybody else. Mm -hmm. Let's boomerang that and put it back on ourselves a little bit and learn how to nourish and fill our own self-love tanks. Mm -hmm. You know what I learned? This is crazy. Bears give birth in hibernation. Mm. So a mama bear can be asleep in hibernation. Wow. And give birth. I'm like, wow. Talk about that for contrast. Yeah. That it can be that we can be so fierce and mama bears and yet, at the same time, give birth while hibernating. Just a wild. Okay. Mm. Last, last question. And then we're going to go and thank you so much for all of your time. Number one tip for someone to um, unwind their nervous system. So I'm hearing a lot that the work you do is, is 
allowing the boundaries to first come from inside and then outside. And a lot of that is getting into the body, somatic work, nervous system, deregulation, unwinding. What's number one tip that you give to women just to start in helping their nervous systems feel mm-hmm. safe? The breath. Mm-hmm. I can't answer that question without, I mean, there's so many tips and tools and strategies I could, but I, I have to go with the breath because yeah. it's there. It's available. It's free. Nobody even needs to know that you're doing it. Mm-hmm. It's medicinal and it's where I started. And so it's so special for me. I didn't even know what I was doing. I had a coach. I don't even know if this coach knew what she was doing, <laughs> but I think she just heard somewhere that it was really cool to breathe. And so part of my homework was to breathe, to just wake up in the morning. And she had me meditate for five minutes. Mariah, I thought I was going to die. I remember sitting there going, I think I'd rather have somebody stab my eyeballs out of my head and serve (laughs) them up off the grill, like grill them up and serve them off to somebody than sit here and meditate for five minutes. It was horrible, but I started to slowly notice. And this is, this is the beauty of somatic work is often it is slow, Mm -hmm. but we start to notice how we, our bodies start to take these different shapes and we start to stand a little more dignified. We start to roll our shoulders back. We start to go kind of from, and I know this is a podcast, so you can't see me. Well, it's both um, video and audio for Facebook people, but it's starting to go from this crouching, hiding, maybe even dukes up position, like, you know, trying to just stay safe and what's somebody going to throw at me and uh, right to opening up and really standing in our dignity and advocating for ourselves. And so I started to just, I I committed. I'm somebody who, if you tell me that this is going to work for me, I really do like to know the reasons why behind it, but I don't know that this coach knew it at the time. I don't know that she knew how to explain it to me, but I trusted her and I thought, okay, if she's telling me to sit for five minutes and connect with myself and breathe, I guess I'm going to do it. And I started to notice I would go from this to this and to this. And and it was so slow. It was so slow. Pretty soon I went from meditating and breathing five minutes to 20 minutes with no problems at all. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon I started to notice how I was showing up a little more proud of myself, a little more confident, a little more full of myself in a beautiful and nourishing way. So combining that with just breathing, you know, there's the four, seven, eight breath, there's box breathing. Oftentimes what I tell people is if you're just getting started, just try to make your exhalation longer than your inhalation because that's you. Yeah. I mean, that's it. That's what I start with. I think that that's the most simple breathe consciously. Yep. And make your exhalation longer than your inhalation. It sends your body into safe. Yep. So good. I'm so glad you said that. And trying to move your breath from the chest, because typically, typically we go, <gasps> right? We have very shallow and the shoulders go up to the ears. So, just, up. Yep. so I like to put my hand on my belly and my other hand on my heart. This is the nurturance mm-hmm. canal. So A, it's like I'm giving myself a nice, beautiful hug. So it's sort of like, <sighs> I see me. I'm safe, right? It's just that self hug. Mm -hmm. Plus I'm able then to push my belly out into that hand that's on the belly to ensure that I'm doing that low belly breathing so -hmm. that I'm not activating because the sympathetic nervous system lives more up here in our chest. So if we're not pushing it down into our belly, we actually can kind of activate the sympathetic a little bit more. I don't want to get too complicated with this, but just the low deep belly. For those that don't know what sympathetic is. Fight or flight. Versus parasympathetic, which is? Which is ventral vagal. Well, there's actually two branches of parasympathetic. There's freeze, which is kind of like that play dead mode. And there's ventral vagal, which that's the space that we connect from. That's the place where we set our boundaries from. That's the place where we experience pleasure and joy and relationship and healthy boundaries. Mm. So when we're pushing that breath into the belly, that is what we are activating is ventral vagal. That's the place where we want to be setting our boundaries from. Mm. So good. So good. All right. I'm sure everybody, if you want to reach out to Krista, her contact information is in the show notes. 
You're welcome to reach out. I, of course, love to hear from you as well. Comment away in the face if you're watching this in Facebook, if you're watching, if you're listening to this in the podcast, whatever it may be, reach out. Let me know what parts are your favorite. How did you, what aspects did really left you leaning in? And Krista, thank you so much for the work that you do in the world. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the show today. I know you have lots of choices and live a very productive life as we all do. I appreciate that you've allowed me to dive deep in your journey of feeling turned on by your life, your lover, and yourself. I trust you learned something, expanded your self-reflection, and you're grateful we shared this time together. Connect with me at www.thewomensvibrancycode.com or on all social media platforms and YouTube by searching for Mariah Brown, M-A-R-A-Y-A Brown. Lastly, if you've found value in what we chatted about in this episode, please consider leaving me a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. It helps others discover the podcast and get a feeling for the wonderful community we've all created together. As for now, I'm Mariah Brown, and you've been listening to the Women's Vibrancy Code.